Hello, everybody. I guess I'm hosting. We, we, this is the second time we've done this. I just said y'all ready and we didn't record. <laughs> <laughs> We're all three co-hosting. This is kind of our part three of what we've been kind of doing. And that's kind of talking about the underbelly of the Great Awakening, which is the shadow work, which is coming into your own understanding of, of what this time period really, really, truly is. And um, it's it, I kind of feel like... In a lot of ways, the three of us were like David and Goliath, but the, the good David and Goliath, where we're up against kind of a, a lot of people that are teaching false information about spirituality and what a great awakening truly, truly, truly is. And so I think it's super important that we're having these conversations because um, I know I agree with Ricardo Bozzi when he said uh, last week that there are certain events that are scheduled to happen, but as far as our ascension and as far as the great flip that we're going to make, it depends on us. And when we're actually done the work ourselves and are ready to move into that fourth density positive, meaning, meaning that no one's going to come and save you. No one's going to come save you. You have to do this yourself. And so, of course, I'm joined today with Stephanie and Emmy. Um, Y'all know Stephanie and Emmy, though. I feel like they don't even need an introduction at this point because they're regulars on this channel and friends of mine off camera. So, um, so anyway, how you guys late? How you ladies doing today? It's been a rough couple days for me, but I'm okay. <laughs> I woke up feeling like I got hit by a Mack truck, so I got my Superman mug. All right, <laughs> girl mug with my coffee. Your coffee. Trying to wake up. I didn't even do my workout this morning because I just like woke up really late, which is unusual. Same. And uh, the, you know what it is? It's the equinox. It's the changing of the seasons, I really feel. Um, you know, it's very drastic up here. We had the weather from Hurricane Fiona come up here. We didn't get the rain, but we got extreme winds. And then like the temperature went from being in the nice 70s all the way into the 50s and I'm like are you kidding me because it normally doesn't hit the 50s until like later in October here so I'm just kind of depressed that it's getting cold already and I woke up freezing so Stephanie, I just have to you'd think that we were neighbors the same thing has been happening here in Michigan the same thing it was it was 81 degrees two days ago and yesterday was 57 and today today the high is going to be 57 it's like yeah I'm not ready for this. I'm not ready either. I don't want to have to put my heat on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just twiddling my thumbs because it's still hot as hell down here. <laughs> so um, well, I'll be paying you a visit then. Okay. Again. Okay. I, I do want to start <laughs> off with that though, because we've been talking about that, Stephanie. Well, first of all, in traditional yoga and traditional spiritual practice, which I'm gonna I want to really talk about a lot today too. There's a lot of topics we want to talk about. And of course, we're gonna be doing multiple parts on this, is gonna be an ongoing series, is the role of a teacher, because teachers are super, super important because spirituality itself has a certain alchemy to it. It's not a free-for-all. Okay, and we'll talk about why that is but i do want to say speaking of the changing of the seasons um in ayurvedic study the changing of the seasons is a very um it should be a very restful time so if you're feeling a little bit extra tired it's because your body's having even here in georgia where our or if you're living in the keys of south florida where it's not as much of a drastic change it's still a change because the earth itself is shifting <laughs> So your body, part of Ayurveda is that your body has to always be at the same alchemy with the exterior world. So like, because I live in a city, I tell this, the students this all the time, because I live in a city, that means I get to drink a beer every now and again and eat greasy French fries because my outside world is very, can be very dirty and toxic. And so if I living in a city were to drink a bunch of pure water and be a full on vegan, that would cause me to go imbalanced because of my environment. Now, if I were to live up in the North Georgia mountains, I could do that because the North Georgia mountains are clean air, fresh air, clean water. Does that make sense? And so with the changing of the seasons, you do want to be a little bit aware that for like a, maybe a six month period, you might be feeling a little bit extra tired. And it's because your body's having to re-alchemize to the new, um, the new season that's coming in. And, um, and it's not a time. There's so many people I've met that think that, you know, the, Going into fall or going into the springtime is a great time to do a cleanse. The changing of the seasons is the worst time to do a cleanse. Do not do a cleanse at the ch changing of the seasons. You will put your body and more importantly, your mind into derangement at that point. 
You have to work with energies that are available to you in that moment. If you want to do like a cleanse or a fast, it needs to be in the middle of summertime or in the middle of winter where your body's already alchemized to the exterior world. Now you said you didn't work out this morning, Stephanie. Well, in traditional yoga and traditional spirituality, we know Saturday is the representation of the planet Saturn. And a lot of people in the truth of the world think that Saturn is just all bad because the dark players, the controllers have inverted Saturn, right? But Saturn was created by God, just like all the other planets were. And Saturn's energy, Saturn is, is the matrix. And, and that, the matrix isn't just, there, we're, there's going to be a matrix in fourth density too, guys. It's just father time. It's just the planet of law and order. And it also, that, with, with that being said, is, can be the planet of karma, so in traditional yoga, traditional spirituality, we don't practice on Saturdays. We rest okay, on Saturdays. So I kind of knew that already, and I have used this as an excuse. I'm like, I'm just going to stay in, but I'm trying to trying to more or less listen to my body. Now, if you're interested, I am working out. I It was so funny, and we can quickly discuss this. So Bryce called me as I just finished and in the entire, no, not the entire, but half of the first primary series which is where I'm up to now and I held that last pose um and I I started to laugh hysterically because I couldn't believe I was holding it and that's the pose where Bryce was like no you can do it you just don't want to do it and I'm yeah. like no I really can't do it and she's like you can you can, you can. It's very uncomfortable pose and she didn't want to do let it let me tell you I was like I'm ready to fight <laughs> Because I was like so exhausted and I have no core strength at that point. And I was able to hold it like the, f the full five times. And then I crashed on my mat after because you take rest after. And she calls me and I'm like, oh, my God, I did it. Oh, fucker. I did it. <laughs> it was really funny. Anyways, I wanted to share that really quickly. But um, where was I going with that? <laughs> <laughs> well, and, well, the traditional yoga. Well, and I and I was we were talking about that because, um, and this is super important, guys. Because I was like, "Are you following the 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 practice posture by posture?" Like I was making sure that Stephanie was not skipping any postures or not interweaving postures. And this is something that's super important, guys. So if we're looking at a, a practice like yoga, yoga is a very very old. It's one of the oldest systematic practices in the world. The first time we have any written account of yoga is in the Bhagavad Gita, which is how many thousands of years old? I don't know. Okay. And so this practice was seen as a spiritual awakening. And so of course, back in ancient times, no one was doing this practice to look good in a bathing suit. Like there wasn't vanity with this practice. It was about really opening up the patterns of the body. When we're working with yoga postures or asanas, each yoga posture holds a particular potency and a particular alchemy. It's an ingredient, right? Every posture, because you have these different pathways in the body that are clogged or stuck. And so the way the traditional practice goes is you'll go up, uh, Pose, counter pose, pose, counter pose, pose, counter pose, neutral posture, neutralizing pose, then pose, counter pose. And every time you hit a neutral pose, which is quarter primary series mark, half primary series mark, three quarters primary series mark, end of primary series, and thus forth with the rest of the series, the neutral posture is a place where you can stop. So if you were to stop your practice on a posture that isn't technically a neutralizing posture, then you are going to end up pushing yourself into the opposite direction of an awakening, right? Because this is so, po it's like taking a bunch of really potent, po like, so a lot of medications, even in plant medicine are technically poisons, right? And if we use the poisons correctly, it can help the body detox and help the body. But if you use them incorrectly, it can cause a shit show. So this is why, this is why, from my education and my experience, you should never, never be going to a class where the teacher is choreographing the, the practice. Traditional yoga follows a set mala of postures that have already been studied and put together to create a desired result, right? So in Ashtanga, we call your practice your prescription, okay? And the teacher... A 200 hour teacher training is not going to give a student or a teacher the education they need to understand all the different components of each posture and how 
you know, if you do Marichasana D by itself without countering it with Navasana, which is the pose you ended on Navasana, then it's going to cause a mental derangement because an energy is going to be opened without a proper uh, subtle or counter energy open to support it or a neutralizer being poster coming in to neutralize the energies of the body. This is why it's so important, guys. And this is why I believe the Yoga Alliance is part of the cabal is because they came in and destroyed this sacred practice. That's why it's so important to follow. If you're going to find a teacher, to find a teacher who is a part of a lineage, meaning that if you look at their resume, if they say, oh, I went through this teacher training or that teacher training, probably not, in my opinion, the best class to go to. Okay. Mm -hmm. Look for, see who was the teacher's teacher. Who is the teacher accountable to? My teacher is Sharat Joyce from KPJAYI. I'm authorized under him. He is the Param Guru of the Ashtanga lineage. His teacher was Patabi Joyce. Patabi's Joyce teacher was Krishnamacharya. Okay, you can you can trace it back. They follow the Yoga Karanta, which is what holds all the prescriptions in that book. They follow it. Okay. Um, and the in the Patanjali system. So this is why it's super important. And we're kind of which kind of leads me into the, the role of the teacher or the guru or the shaman. All right. It is of the utmost importance when you start a spiritual path that you have a teacher. A guru, again, the word guru means to transmute darkness to light. That's what guru means. Now, guru in yoga is like a master teacher. Okay, I'm not talking about a cult leader. I'm not talking about someone who's, you know, my teacher in India doesn't, I have to find my own apartment. I, he doesn't help with that. I prepare my own food. There's no food served to you. It's just a school you go to. He is hands off when it comes to what you do outside of the classroom. You can go to him and talk to him about issues in your life. He never, I've had many meetings with him. He never tells you what to do. He always just gives you metaphors from the yoga sutras and then basically ask you, what do you want to do? That's a healthy boundary. So I'm not talking about cult leaders. If you're going to someone who is dictating who you hang out with, what you eat, all that kind of stuff, that's dangerous. I'm talking about a master teacher. All right. And the, the teachers they add in there too, Bryce. So when you say teacher too, we, they, they need to have some sort of resume. Yes. Yes. Not just somebody who claims they know things. They, they need a, a resume. Yeah, I, I, have a, I have a paper, an actual paper that says that I am authorized by KPJAY in Mysore, India to teach mm -hmm. this. I have signed a contract with the school in India. Now, this was before the lockdown, so obviously things have changed now. But before that, I had to sign a contract that I would return to India every 18 months to, to, to work with my teacher so that he can make sure that I'm still on the right path, right? And that's the teacher's role. You know, when we talk about the word guru, meaning to, tr to transform darkness to light, I cannot do that for you. My teacher cannot do it for me. All the teacher does, the, the teacher is not gonna be somebody that's gonna blow smoke up your ass. They're not gonna be somebody that's gonna coddle you. They're gonna, in a very tough love kind of way, help you stay on the path, right? And they're, and they're gonna be- Accountable, right? Do what? Hold you accountable. Hold you accountable. And as we tell our students in, in, at AYA, you know, that's why in, in traditional yoga, the postures are not a free for all. Like you're given postures by your teacher. You can't just skip ahead without your teacher giving you those postures because your teacher has more experience than you do. You know, it takes about 10 years to finish primary series alone in order to teach my store what I teach. You have to have completed both primary and second series and possibly a little into third in order to just teach my store. That's not a 200 hour course. That's many, 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 many years. That's why there are no 22 year old Ashtanga teachers out there. They're all in their forties, fifties and sixties. Cause it takes that many years of your own tutelage in order to then hold down a Mysore room. And so part of that job too, with a teacher, and I've done this before and I've had it done to me before is a teacher will give you postures. They'll watch you work on these postures. And if they see that maybe it might be a little too much for you at the moment, they'll pull you back again. Like if they see that, you know, it's, 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 it's walking a tightrope, right? Like we want to have a controlled demolition of your emotions. We want to, we want to push you into a dark night of the soul so that you can start the, the, to reconstruct yourself and create new patterns. However, if it's too much, then it's going to affect the nervous system. So we have to pull you back. Does that make sense? There's an alchemy to this. 
and this is, and, and, and I'm seeing this in our, in our, um, our spiritual world. Well, first of all, we're seeing people tell you they can activate you. They can do this. I was saying before we started filming, I had my first uh, two Muna Key um, initiations yesterday with my friend, the first two of nine. And even though my friend is Cindy, who's on the channel a lot, is the one doing the activations, it was said multiple times, which I understand, that the activations will only work to the level that I accept them. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take many, 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 many years sometimes for them to, to fully come into activation. Right. And so when we're talking about transmuting darkness to light, you're the one, no one's going to come around and like bippity boppity boo you on your third eye. And all of a sudden, boom, all your karma is corrected. No. In fact, the, the, the role of the teacher sometimes is to instigate that karma to happen faster for you. And so that you do, and that you have that person that's able to sit there while you're crying on your mat, not coddle you, but tell you like, this is normal. Feel it. Breathe in, breathe in it, and then keep practicing. This is very normal. And we have these people out there saying, oh, I can activate you. Oh, we see it with the med bed phenomenon. You know, I'll use, let's use like weight gain, because that's something that everybody, a lot of people struggle with. So if you're someone that thinks that the med bed is just going to get you skinny, it's not going to work. We see this with people in our society. When people go on crash diets, they get really skinny, and then they gain the weight back. When somebody is overweight, that's a root chakra imbalance or underweight. But we'll talk about overweight. That's a root chakra imbalance. The food is not what's making you overweight. It's something that's broken within you. And until that wound is healed, I've seen people heal that wound and all of a sudden they lose weight and the weight never comes up. They, they never get overweight again. Mm -hmm. Right? So why would the med bed then fix that? It can't. You are, you are your med bed. You are the med bed. I think in the society that we live in um, with the medical community pushing medications as band-aids and because they're petroleum based and you get an instant uh, change, we expect that instant gratification and healing is not instant. I mean, it can be if our level of awareness is able to understand the quantum field and pull our healthy self into ourselves, you know, because really anything other than love is an illusion. It's a, it's a disharmony. It's an imbalance. And if we can see that and understand that, but most of us don't see and understand what the quantum field is like particle science, a particle exists with all possibilities, but we can only see one at a time. Um, but there have been many cases where there's been instantaneous healing simply because the person is able to see the perfect version of themselves and call that into being in the physical world. And, and that's really what instantaneous healing is all about. Um, I think another thing too is that spiritual awakening is not a fun process. No. And I think we a lot of us have been delusioned um, into believing and thinking that, you know, when we have a spiritual awakening, everything is going to be beautiful and rosy and sunshine and lollipops and rainbows. And spiritual awakening feels like you're losing your goddamn mind. Yeah. And it feels like everything is falling apart within you. Everything's falling apart outside of you. And we're taught these instantaneous gratification uh, methods with pharmaceuticals. And we want to escape. We want to bypass. We want to go around. We don't want to feel this stuff. Because we still have to go to work. We still have to raise our families. We still have to grocery shop. We still have to get gas and, and all of that stuff. So who's got time for, you know, this awful feeling that, that I have, you know, doctor fix me. Um, so I think that if we can understand and realize what exactly spiritual awakening is, so that when it happens to us and it happens in stages, you know, I got it's different for for different people, but ideally it would happen in stages and and have like layers peeled off like an onion, um, because rapid spiritual awakening, like you were saying, Bryce, can cause 
absolute delusion of the mind. Like it is, if your body is not, if your nervous system is not prepared and you have this Kundalini awakening, it is like, it's like oh, you're her. losing your mind. It's like you're losing your mind. Like it, it, it is. There's a book. I'm, when we are finished recording, I'll put a link to the book. So I have to text and ask what name of the book is um, about a person that had like a Kundalini awak awakening too soon. And it was not, it was not good. And you wrote a whole book on the experience, but you're absolutely right. And I'll give you guys an example. A couple of years ago, actually it's probably, it was probably around 2017. Um, is when I moved into this place in Midtown. So yes, it was 2017. I was going through this really, really dark night of the soul. Like really, really, as I walked through the valley of the shadow of death type of like for two months straight, I was crying every day. We had moved into this new place. Um, Robbie was a puppy. I, I was teaching. I was practicing. I was preparing to go back to India. And I would literally be sobbing all day, every day. And I was so depressed. It was probably one of the lowest places of depression I'd ever been in my life. But this is why I had gotten to a place, you know, when we study the theory of yoga, we're looking at the two, the Prakriti and the Purusha, the Prakriti being the nature, the Shakti, the expression of the soul and the Purusha being the soul itself. Now, the only thing that really directly connects to Ishvara or God is the soul is Purusha. The Prakriti, the nature, God is in the nature, but it's also our created experience. Our, we created this experience for ourselves. And the two rules of Prakriti, Prakriti is anything that has a birth, a life, and a death. And because that first rule, because it has a birth, a life, and a death, that means that it's always shifting and changing. And the yoga sutras tell us that our human um, condition, our human suffering comes from because we confuse who we really are. We think who we really are. I think who I really am is Bryce, this flesh and bones, this hair, this life. But this identity will die one day. Whether that's tomorrow or 400 or a thousand years from now with the new 4D earth, I don't know. But one day, this physical form will need to go back to the earth. So what continues then is Parusha is the soul. Now the soul lives many lives and through many lives creates many. It's like changing outfits, right? It's like one day you wear a dress. One day you wear a shorts and a t-shirt. One life you're in royalty. The next life you're a pauper. You know, it's just changing outfits to have an experience, right? So the soul can have an experience to know itself. Well, what I was going through was that realization of mortality. And we all know we're going to die one day. That's not a, that's not a, a, that's not a spoiler alert, right? But the realization, the hardcore realization that came through my practice was that when I die, I'm no longer Bryce. So then who am I? And it brought me to a really deep, dark place of, 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 of life and mortality. And at the end of that though, came a sense of liberation. And I remember once I was driving and for a split second, it was like, I had this like Prati Bob moment where I started laughing. Cause I was like, Holy shit, none of this is real. It's kind of like the first time I did shrooms, I had the same realization, like none of this is real. So if it's not real, then why am I taking it so seriously? And then of course, I dropped back down into my body and I took it seriously again. And I was reading this morning one of the quotes from a great Indian teacher saying that the, the minute you realize not to take life so seriously is when liberation begins. Because mm -hmm. this is all, it's all a created hologram. But in that those two months, I went through a deep depression. I was mourning the fact that who I think I am as Bryce is not real. I was mourning that mm -hmm. in order to then make way for the new understanding. And then to be able to marry the dance together, being able to stand in my integrity as Bryce in this moment with also the understanding that this is not even really who I am. Does that make sense? Yes. It makes that's sense. The hard dance. It is. it is. Because we, we are so attached to who we are in this body. Um, and we identify as this body that we're in right now. And when you go through a spiritual awakening, part of that is realizing that you are so much more than just this body. We're all projections or fractals or pieces of source consciousness. And this physical being is the filter 
through which that source consciousness is having a perspective right now. And we have 8 billion perspectives of the one infinite creator walking the planet right now. And we chose to forget who we were so that we could have an organic experience as a separate self, even though we are not a separate self. And part of spiritual awakening is realizing that this separate self, like you were saying, Bryce, is an illusion. It's not real. It's not real. And we're so attached to this identity and this body that we make it real. And when we start to realize that I'm so much more because we've been in this little box. And when we step outside of the box or when the box is opened, it's almost too much. And you have this existential crisis. Like, I mean, it's, it can be scary. It can be can be scary but Mm -hmm. on the other side like you were saying on the other side once you can um wrap your head around and get comfortable with that idea um it's so freeing it is so freeing and then you can look at other people and accept them where they are and have compassion and love and just realize that they're a piece of god and they just don't remember yet there's a delusion. That's what Maya, that's what the yoga sat sutras call Maya is we're living in delusion about who we are. Um, and that's, that's the other thing we were talking about past lives last week. That's why it's so important that we keep past lives where they need to be. Yes. The same issue might follow you from life to life to life, but that's because that's an issue that you're still needing. Your soul still needs to work through and your, your soul is giving you different experiences with different outfits on to see which outfit is going to trigger the learning of that experience. If we harp on who we were in the past, which we see some people doing, then we're still stuck in that delusional thinking of property of Maya. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And it is, it is a very interesting dance. It's not, I'm not saying with that being said that you need to be out there and be like, Oh, it doesn't matter because I'm not real anyway. No, you still have to act in integrity. That's why Ahemza is the first law of yoga. It's nonviolence. You still have to be able to be truthful and work on yourself and be the best version of this outfit you can be. But also knowing that it's not permanent and it's not forever and ashes to ashes. And I know Richard Freeman said that once that one of the main jobs of the yoga student is to prepare for death. It's one of the biggest things you're doing in your yoga practice is you're preparing for death. So that when death comes one day, it's, it's just as sacred as birth. Mm -hmm. You can let go. That's why Mm -hmm. I, when I'm in Indiana, now I know there are haunted places, places in India for sure, but being down here in the South and growing up in a haunted house and being around a a lot of haunted places, it's not near as intense in India. And my perspective of, of this is that in India, this is taught in their religion. This is taught in Hinduism. This is taught the idea of reincarnation. And so there's not a lot of hanging on. So I think sometimes when we have hauntings, it's people literally trying to hang on to their property. Instead of we also we have a large population too of Christians who don't they're not taught reincarnation at all. So I kind of want to just touch on the whole reincarnation, multiple lives, why some people, I in my opinion, are so stuck on past life stuff because this is a realization that kind of came to me because when I first awakened now I was in stages like you said I mean a lot of times it's in stages the first stage of it was uh beginning of 2020 and it was a very slow process of me starting to realize something is just not right in the world but September August of 2020 I then kind of snapped awake to some things and then thought it was literally the apocalypse. So I was doomsday shopping. I actually did go a little delusional. I had a nervous breakdown uh, in the beginning of 2021, a literal nervous breakdown. I was sick physically. I was sick mentally. And everything I knew and my goals in this 3D matrix were starting to collapse. And for the majority, I was actually happy about it because life never felt right to me anyways. But when I started to venture into the reincarnation thing, because I was so programmed to not believe in that stuff, it became a subject of interest. 
And I became obsessed about it to a certain degree. I'm not a very obsessive person. It was more or less, it's like I found a really, really good book and I couldn't stop reading it. Does that make sense? So because I was so, it's like holding your child back and, and sheltering your child. By the time they turn 18 years old, they might go and just party, 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 party because they were so held back by really strict parents. Well, it was the same concept. I was so held back by the church that once I came into the realization of this, I just, it was like the major subject of interest. So I did become a little bit like, I wouldn't say delusional, but I could have gotten to that point. And so I look at it now as just information. It's just information. information. Yeah. Um, yeah. And my biggest thing right now is working on the person I am in this lifetime, because it is an escapism if we are holding on to past life stuff um, so much that we're not paying attention to what's happening now. And it's, it's like, yeah, you might be, like you said, Bryce, you might bring stuff over, but if you're not going to learn it in this lifetime, you're going to have to go back and learn it in the next one. So why wouldn't you want to just learn it now? Yeah. And, <laughs> like, and the thing about now, let's, let's like look at reincarnation a little bit. Cause I know there's probably people, a lot of people watching us that grew up Christian and were not taught reincarnation. Now I grew up Christian, but I grew up with a grandmother, my dad's mom, who hid books on reincarnation under the bed for my grandfather, even though she played the church on every Sunday morning or the, she played the organ every Sunday morning at church. So I had a grandmother who was very, I think she was probably a very old soul for talking about reincarnation because she grew up in South Georgia where very, very Christian. But um, so I kind of was already exposed to it. And I started studying it when I was like in my early 20s in school. I started reading a lot of uh, Dr. Wise's books. Uh, many minds, many masters. And I just thought this is very interesting. And then you realize the Bible does speak about reincarnation. It does. Yeah. Born again. Yeah. Well, we, let's look at being born. What is like, because we know symbolically that Yahshua, the Christ was never literally crucified on a cross because the God of truth of life of sort doesn't do human sacrifice or blood rituals. That's what Lucifer does. But let's look at resurrection in the idea of reincarnation in our lives because the soul energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be changed and transmuted. And so we have, we live many lives in one lifetime. Anyway, think about your life and how many chapters of your life you've lived. So you died to your old self and then you were born again to a new awakening to your new self. You were resurrected into your new self. You know, I look at those, um, I mean, I've had many dark nights of the soul, the whole 16 years of doing this practice. Most of it has been spent in tears, honestly, it's been spent in tears and physical pain because the physical pain is a representation of the emotional pain when you're going through this, just the discontrolled demolition. But if I look at those like two months where I was really having that mortality crisis, you can see those two months as being like in the underworld, right? Mm -hmm. In the underworld of hell. And then at the end of it, resurrecting again into a new life, a new understanding. It's a new mm -hmm. understanding, a new perspective, right? It's not that what you were seeing wasn't always there to begin with. It's just you couldn't see it until you actually course corrected some patterns of thought, you know? And, and we see that really big. I mean, I've been talking a lot with Angie down here. Uh, you met Angie Stephanie. She's here in very Southern girl, Southern culture. Like my name is a family name. We have this, this pride, this family pride. And that's who you are. I'm part of the Bryce family. My mom, my name's my mom's maiden name, the Williams Bryce stadium at the university of South Carolina. My grandmother's cousin is the late Strom Thurmond, the longest running Senator who was really bad. That, that was very family prideful, but that's none of that's real. None of it's real. It's not who I am as a soul. It's not who any of you are as a soul. The outer circumstances, if you read the law of one and you look at a lot of the channelings, it's kind of comical because they tell us that when we sit down up in the heavens, when we're in just our soul form and we're about to come back into another experience as a soul, we perceive this one life to be really fast. And so we'll sit there and we'll be writing our soul contract and we're going we're to try to get all these experiences, you know, like we're loading up ourselves on all these experiences we want to have in this incarnation, you know, to experience them and grow. And some of our spirit guides and uh, our higher level souls have to step in and be like, no, 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 this is too much. 
you can't you can't go through 20 abusive relationships in one lifetime that's too much they it's kind of comical they have to like pull us back a little bit because when we get into this earth we do go through that realm of amnesia and so we come into this world and we're like oh shit oh shit oh shit oh shit oh shit all of this is real and it sucks and how do i get out of this well the way out of it is not to run away the way out of it is to be able to find that inner peace while being in it. Yeah. Can you find yeah. the inner peace while living in the matrix? We don't know when we're going to flip. None of us do. And it really depends on the collective as a whole from what I understand. So at this point, all of us have to live in that Saturnalian matrix of third density. Mm -hmm. Can you live? Can you go to your job every day? The one you hate and find peace with being there at the moment. Mm -hmm. Is that possible to do that? And true peace is no matter what your circumstances, you're still at peace. Yeah. And um, I mean, sometimes change is necessary with certain things, but it doesn't mean you have to completely run away from your entire life, hide out in the woods and, and call it a day so that you can find peace. We still have to do matrix work, cleaning your house and, you know, folding the laundry and earning money and um, all sorts of things. And, and yeah, a lot of us had to get creative about earning our money and everything like that. I mean, a year ago, I would never think that I was going to be reading the cards for people because a year ago I was still stuck in religious land. Um, <laughs> but, and that was another part of my awakening too, was I, I had everything I had learned in church was crumbling. I can't tell you how many times I did have cognitive dissonance about, uh, especially that, um, what Jesus name meant. That was the beginning of my religious awakening. Um, I, I went to you, Bryce. That's actually what put me on the dark outpost in the first place was my deep diving into what the name Jesus meant in the fact that it did not mean something good at all. And that he was not some wonderful person who died for our sins on a cross and everything and realizing, no, that I had to fix everything within me. And that was a huge part of my crashing and burning and going through my own hell. Um, you know, I not only lost people around me because I didn't decide to put some sort of chemical in my body, if you know where I'm going with that. A lot of people perceived me as literally having a mental breakdown because my whole entire world was crashing and burning. All of my own matrix was crashing and burning. And as much as it was liberating at the other end of it, it still was hell to go through. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're not gonna you're not gonna be able to come out the other side of a spiritual awakening without getting some bumps and bruises and burns mm -hmm. along the way. That's part of the awakening is going through hell. Um, again, the Bhagavad Gita. We the whole story of the Bhagavad Gita is Arjuna is a. I've told this before, but let's really think about this in metaphor because a lot of the Hindu um, mythology is metaphor. So Arjuna is standing on a battlefield. He has to go to war. He's got to go slaughter people that are standing across from him that he's loved in his life, his friends, his family, his teachers. And he's having this moment of like, oh, shit, I don't want to do this. And so Krishna is the avatar that comes to him. And Krishna Krishna's having a conversation with him. And you would think in spiritual form, Krishna would be like, back away. Don't do it. But Krishna was like, no, toughen up, buttercup. You signed up to be a warrior. You pick this. Go be a warrior. Go do it. And that was the biggest, one of the most enlightening things about the Bhagavad Gita. And Krishna also says, this is a big one I got from the Bhagavad Gita too. Love the work for the sake of the work, not for the fruits of your labor. How many of us are trained to go out there and do all this work, all this work to make that money? And we live miserable lives, but yet we got a bank account full of money. What if, what if we do the work because we love it? What if instead of coming to the mat every day, we don't dread it, but we go, you know what? This is going to be hard, but I'm going to love every minute of it. I'm going to be present with it. I'm going to feel every sensation. I'm going to understand that my body is simply reacting to my thoughts. That's why I told you, you can do Navasana. 
You didn't. It's you- funny because when I was on the mat yesterday, I'm like, you can do it. You got this. You love every bit of this. No, you don't. Yes, you do. <laughs> I was like, I love it. You, can, you can be in the posture. There's so many postures I am. Most postures I don't love. And I'm like, no, I don't love this posture. I hate this posture. But I hate this posture because what it's coming up in me, and I'm going to sit with that. I'm going to sit yeah. in hatred and I'm going to sit with that sensation because the more my body, the more my mind can sink into whatever energy is being opened in this posture that's not comfortable, the more I can sit with that and experience it and not run from, run from it, the faster it's going to move. And, the, and when it starts to move, that's when the layers start to peel back and I start to go, oh, this is why. This is why I react this way to things because of this right here. She'll be back, guys. She'll be back. <laughs> she just hey. she's going to take a bathroom break. Um, so, but yeah. So it's and that's and that's. Emmy, you were saying the other day that you were doing the ashtang or the bar, and you had something trigger in your body that you hadn't experienced before. Correct? Yeah, I don't. I don't. I still don't know what exactly it was, but something was released, and uh, it just needed to be felt. And the entire day, I was just an absolute mess. I was sad. I was angry. I was depressed. I was anxious. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes it helps if I can see where it's coming from so that I can heal that thing uh, or work on that thing. But when that thing doesn't show up, um, I just know that, okay, I just need to move this energy. Everything is energy these feelings are just energy. I just need to let them flow. I just need to let it flow and, and let it transmute. And, you know, I, I can do things to help myself like self Reiki and meditation and, um, being present in the moment. Uh, one thing that was really eye opening yesterday, uh, I did this meditative eating exercise that I was reading about in Ram Dass's version of um, the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. And I had this completely and totally blissed out uh, experience while eating my salad yesterday for lunch. Um, so what you do, yes, that book right there. I'll put a link to it in the description box, guys. This is the, this is one of the most amazing commentaries on the Gita that she's talking about. You can see my copy is very old. <laughs> it's very, so so in, in, in that book, um, Ram Das explains how you can do this meditative eating exercise and you completely separate yourself from what you're doing. It's all impersonal. And so you just note what you're doing. Okay. I'm intending to take my arm and scoop a bite of food. So as you're doing that, you say intending, intending, and then you pick up the bite and, um, you know, you say opening, opening, you open your mouth. And so you're just completely disconnected from what you're doing personally. It's all impersonal. It's just, you're just observing and witnessing your actions and, it's amazing because when you take the bite and you notice, okay, now I'm tasting. Okay, now I'm chewing. And you're just really, really present in the moment, observing and focusing on the actions of what you're doing. And for that, for that moment, for those like 10 minutes, I was completely and totally in touch with who I really am. And I was just watching myself do this do these things and i was so incredibly grateful like i was i was moved to tears yes a course of miracles i'm I'm studying a course of miracles the law of one and the bhagavad gita all at the same time and there's so many similarities and correlations and commonalities that um it's really really fulfilling and rich and and this meditative practice that i did yesterday was just you I can't describe it you just have to do it and experience it for yourself but when you can when you can be with yourself 
who you really are, that peace of God, that essence of source consciousness, and just observe what you're doing, everything becomes a miracle. Everything becomes miraculous. And I just remember I was sitting there and I, I, I had a bite and I was bringing it to my mouth and I just stopped. And I was just like, completely blissed out. I'm just like, and I was so grateful that, oh my gosh, I get to taste things. I get to eat food. I get to feel feelings. Like when you are pure light, pure consciousness, I don't think we know what that feels like. And then we come into the the physical and we forget Mm -hmm. who we are and we're feeling these things and experiencing these, these things like for the first time but not really because we just choose to forget so that when we feel them and do them, it is like the first time. And and we do that so that we can have an organic experience every time so that we can actually learn what we wanted to learn. But when you can connect with who you really are, even just for a moment, everything falls away and you're just like completely consumed with this love and this joy and this peace that is, it just transcends all understanding. I mean, it it's really emotional. I mean, it, you can see that I'm getting all teared up, but it it is it is an experience like nothing else. There is no drug on the planet. I've tried a few. There is no medication on the planet. I've had many. There is no love experience. There's no sex. There's no nothing compares to falling in love with who you really are and spending time with who you really are and being able to connect like that. It's just like, it's just mind blowing. And isn't that, that's like the crux of all these spiritual teachings is that the past and the future don't exist. The past and the future are thoughts in our head. The past isn't coming back and tomorrow never happens. And most of us live in the past or the future. We're constantly going between the two, but God lives in the now. There was one person who said, like, when you die, you die in the now. When you're born, you're born in the now. Right now is all that you have. And those exercises that he talks about, I've done that before with just basic stuff I do around the house. Like if I'm in the shower, um, instead of thinking about, because I do struggle with anxiety, which is a future-based trauma. Um, If you're looking at that spiritually, it's worried about the future. Um, And... I'll be shampooing my hair instead of thinking about things I have to do that day. I stop myself and I say, right now I'm shampooing my hair. Right now I'm feeling the suds in my hair. Right now I'm shaving my legs. I'm creating lines. Look, I'm shaving my legs. Right now I'm putting soap on my body. When I'm exercising, I do this a lot in my exercises, whether it's on a yoga mat or a bar class, instead of thinking about what's coming next, I bring myself into my body in that moment, whether it's uncomfortable or not. And I try to pull myself into the sensation of what's moving in my body. And when things come up and that whole idea of just observing, that's huge in yoga too, because we call Purusha the watcher and Prakriti the watchable or the seer. Purusha is the steer. Prakriti is the seeable. So Purusha, your soul I, I explain it to my beginner class a lot like this. This is the best way I know how to explain it. Have you ever had a night where you got really drunk and there's a part of you that you can sense is observing yourself being drunk? Like, you know, you're really drunk. There's that part of you that sees that. That's your parusha seeing your life. So if you settle into the, the parusha is just watching your life unfold, watching you experience these experiences and have these feelings while it's literally the observer, that's literally all it's doing. The Purusha is not invested in whether it's a good outcome or a bad outcome. Even the aspect of good and bad are energies we put into a situation. So if we look at like bad karma, let's see, let's say if someone gets mugged, we would see that as bad. But what's happening is someone literally just took a bag from you. That's all the action was, Right. And so it's, it's the emotion we put in or into these actions that cause the trauma, which then we have to experience and work through. But the parusha is just observing it. It's not involved. And when we can tap into this, a good example, even though we know the Bible is pretty corrupt, um, Paul, when he was going to be executed, is when he wrote the letter to the Corinthians about what love is. 
So he had a piece in him and he was going to be executed. So he had found some sense of awakening, which we know that's not the awakening the church tells you it is. It wasn't, it was through the, that's what Yahshua and Magdalene taught. They didn't mm -hmm. teach you. Yahshua and Magdalene didn't teach you that they were going to do it for you. Don't worry. I got it for you. No, they taught you how to do it yourself. They were teachers. They weren't saviors. They were teachers. They were gurus. They were teaching you to transmute your own darkness into light, to be accepting as death is just death. Once you get to that enlightenment, you view death the same as you view going to the supermarket. It's just something you're experiencing. You know, and that being in the now, it, I totally, I, if, if you're cooking, now I'm cut, now I'm cutting up carrots. Now I'm cutting up carrots. I'm not doing yeah. anything, but just cutting carrots right now. And it does work. It brings you to this place of really being in your body and really being, and, and you do come to this place of total just observance where you're experiencing, you're feeling, but you're not invested. You're just experiencing. Mm -hmm. And that's huge in spirituality. Mm -hmm. I want to touch base mm -hmm. on the here and now too, because in another perspective, I guess in another way of saying it, you know, when, and I've been a big time with, you know, living too much in the past and then trying to race to my future. Right. And I think especially like when we're in our, our twenties, we do that a lot. You know, if we're in this, uh, in a new relationship with somebody, we'll do that a lot. But we're missing the point if we're not in the now, because then we're missing the journey to get to the goal. It's like when I'm doing yoga or bar, my mind, when I used to do exercise, my mind was always focused on the weight loss, always focused on the weight loss. And it was always focused on the goal. However, I was missing the journey of it. Well, why did I get to this point where I gained weight? Why, what, what do I need to work on besides just exercising um to get to a weight what what brought me here in the first place so now my mind is more or less like on the journey rather than the goal i'm not worried about weight loss when i'm doing my yoga i'm actually working i'm, I'm worried about getting anything that you know has caused me trauma or pain or is blocking my energy to transmute it and to heal and to go into that dark night of the soul, even though it's not comfortable. That's what I'm more worried about. I, the weight is, is secondary, right? So I think we try to race ourselves to the finish line way too quickly. And we're missing the point when we're so focused on the goal or so focused on the past that we're not really like in the now moment, actually focused on the now moment. And what we need to work on in the now moment. Does that make sense? Well, I'm being focused solely on the weight loss for social acceptance is, is looking for validation outside of yourself. It's the same thing we do. How many, like I know when I studied uh, weight, the way down workshop with uh, Gwen, Laura, Sham 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 Shamblin, Laura, whatever her name is, a girl who just passed away. Um, I did a lot of research and statistics and the highest level of obesity is found in the um, fundamentalist church churches, Christian churches. And it's because people are have to eat their emotions because they're taught that no Jesus is doing it for you. You you can't possibly do it for yourself. And so then you don't deal with it and you just continue creating karma, creating issues for yourself. Right. When we finally realized that, like, and I was telling you on the, the phone yesterday, Stephanie, that in the Yoga Sutras, it's potentially tells you that everything you have, everything you need in this world, you already have within you. And it took me many years to figure that out, what he was saying. Your healing lies within you. You need a teacher. Yes, of course you need a teacher because this is a very old, sacred path we're on if you just do a free-for-all of spirituality it's going to be chaos do not go paying someone a shit ton of money without looking at their resume without asking them what their experience is my resume on the on the websites where i teach is a really long my bio is really long. I name all of my teachers. I name all of my teachers in India, not just my asana teachers, but I name my Sanskrit teacher, who he is, what his accreditation is. So you can take those names and Google them and see who these people are. Also, I want to touch base on this really quickly. And I'm not pointing out any names, but this is something that really perturbed me. There are, there's an individual or multiple that are actually using Bryson, my name to promote their business saying we recommend them and that is not true. I recommend Emmy because Emmy has actually done work on me. 
I know she has integrity. I know that she, I mean, you, you're very clear about it before you even start the session. You're just the conduit. The client is actually the healer. You're just the conduit and you make that very clear. So I know how Emmy does business. I've, and I've known you actually before you even had a channel. <laughs> so, um, you know, I do promote Emmy, but even if I've had somebody on my channel, if I have not promoted their business, I don't know them well enough or they are scam artists. So I want to kind of put that out there because my name was being used and this is not, it. anyways, I'm not going to go deep into it, but I, that really upset me yeah. <laughs> when that, I found that out. I had an email come into me um, saying something about uh, an individual um, that I did know and I didn't even know she had a business going on. So, and there's no training, nothing. Yeah, you they have it. And I'm going to explain this from a yoga perspective. I was telling this to you the other day, Stephanie. Let me just give you an example of how much experience your teacher teacher should have. Let's just look at something very basic as at physical stuff. Cause that's how that's in yoga. That's how we start with the asana of the body is cause that's what we can relate to the most. That's we use the illusion to fuel our understanding of the, the destruction of the illusion. But with that being said, there are different pathways of energy that relate to the energetic body that connect to the soul within the body. So I was telling you, Stephanie, that nobody should be doing handstands until they can drop back, stand up from a, like in a, in a back bend, they can actually stand up from a back bend and then drop to the floor or, and, or until they can catch their ankles in a back bend. Why is that? Because doing the handstand is going to clog, clog because of the strength being built. The strength is necessary. But if you can't already catch your ankles in a back bend or stand up, drop back in a back bend, then you've clogged something before you got a chance to open it. This is, this is what I'm talking about with the potency. This is why it takes years for people to be able to teach this stuff. I know that as a teacher. I also, because I've been at this for 16 years, Ekapadishir Shasana, one of the biggest postures that people want to do in Ashtanga. It's one leg behind the head pose. It's a beautiful posture when people do it, have been doing it for a really long time. When people first start doing it, it, they don't look so pretty doing it. But over time, when they open, it's a very beautiful posture. And everyone wants to be able to do it so they can take that beautiful Instagram picture. But when you start pulling someone's leg behind their head, because you have to as a teacher, you have to help them, guide them, pull the leg behind their head. You are cranking up that hip opening to the maximum. And so much shit starts to come up for the student. So as a teacher who's experienced that for years now, I have to be able to stand in the mice room and pull my students leg behind their head, be able to feel the sensation in their nervous system to understand what, where I need to release or where I can keep pushing. And I also need to be able to understand their physical reaction emotionally to this posture too. Because if it seems like it too much is happening, then I need to tell them, you know what? We need to wait a couple of months before we revisit this again. Let's work the hips in a different way. And then we'll return to this because I need to have that experience myself in my own body to be able to gauge that in somebody else's body and take on that responsibility as a teacher, you know, and that's why it's really important that you look at these resumes and that I know Emmy has had teachers. I know that she has been studying with other people. That's why I recommend Emmy as well. And Emmy, I wanted to point something out. We were talking about this kind of last week before we sign off for the day for four today and this is the concept of the bundas which you said you that you guys don't really talk about this in reiki do you no now the bundas are really important in uh, yoga and the asana because they're the energetic locks and so if we look at the root bunda which is in the perineum which is mola bunda so the root chakra is muladhara mola is root um root bunda is mola bunda this is a literally like pulling up of the perineum and so it's like, um, what's those Kegel exercises women do? It's like that you're pulling it up. Mm -hmm. Now it also comes from your big toe. So when I'm in India, they will literally stick their hands in your crotch 
to feel to make sure your bunda is locked up. I can't. And in India, it's just not weird. It's not weird in India when they do that. It's just very normal. But in America, we I can't, I'm not going to do that. So what I look for is the big toe. And so the big toe will press into the big toe, presses up through the inner thigh into mola bunda. So if I see a student's toe is lifted off the floor, I know their mola bunda is not engaged. Now let's talk about why, what could have happened. Because the reason why I recommend bar is because when she does those pelvic tilts she's actually engaging both mola bunda and uddiyana bunda so there's a lot of people that teach breathing wrong in yoga asana they tell you to belly breathe you do not want to belly breathe and when you're doing yoga asana because of uddiyana bunda uddiyana bunda is the pulling up of the navel so it's the pulling the navel into the spine and pulling it up into the solar plexus which works with mola bunda so when you're coming into that you're actually pulling everything up into that stomach right? There's a huge power source there. It's catching that kundalini energy. It's not, we always laugh. If you, if you fart in yoga class, you lost your mola bunda, right? You, the energy needs to stay in. Yeah. Jala and Dala bunda is mostly done in a breathing classes where you're pulling in the lock there, but it's also, if you see that the, the, the head's tilted, it's allowing the spine to open up, which is shashumna. So what happens a lot with mola bunda, and the reason why I wanted to pull the bring this up today especially for women so mola bunda is in the crotch we have been so shamed mm -hmm. by sexuality by sexual trauma that we have a really hard time accessing mola bunda it took me years to figure out how to pull up my perineum now in sports, they also do bunda work in sports too. They don't call it that though. So if you see like gymnasts or dancers and they're able to like do a pose really smoothly, we call it floating in yoga. They're very smooth. It's because they have bunda control. That's mm -hmm. what's being controlled. And so sometimes what happens is when mola bunda, when you tap into that for the very first time in your body, it will trigger an emotional response especially if there's trauma in that area. And it could be, it could also be trauma from childbirth, from giving birth. Mm -hmm. when, when, that's why women don't practice on their periods. When you're in your period, you don't have malabunda. It's like a wet paper towel because your body's detoxing. So the malabunda retracts at that time. When you're giving birth, malabunda retracts. And if you see, so this is malabunda all the way up to jaw and dollar. Now your seventh uh, chakra is right at the top of your head. These bundas are what are locking in the energy to stay in that spine and move through up and down through the spine and up and through all through all the chakras and in through all the values, the pathways that come through the body. So the lock on the bunda is what's igniting that energetic flow. And that's why the bunda work again is so important in yoga asana to get that. Now, usually people who have strong bundas are pretty fit. They have pretty strong cores because they can pull in pretty easily. So it does take time to really, and it's a constant, it's a constant work in progress. It's a constant, there's never a time where your body's like, yeah, strong enough. No, no, no. It's always, mm -hmm. it's always a work in, in process and being able to pull Udiana Bunda in that, you know, with the, the ribs are coming out to hold that and control that. You know, I think in Pilates, they call it your powerhouse. They're different they call it different things in different disciplines, but that is, pro and I wanted to point that out because that's such an important thing that you tapped on in any where you're like, I don't know what that is. And for a lot of people, it is because you tapped into Mola Bunda mm -hmm. and, it, and it tapped into to, um, a trauma that that could be from this life. Again, it could be something carrying over for a past life. Does not matter? The trauma is still there. They're the work to work through. And it's not just women that have trauma and there are men who have trauma in that area as well. But as women, we're told not to even think about that area right? That's a private, that's a private zone. That's like, we don't talk about that. And then when you start to activate that pulling up through basically through your vagina as a woman, that's what you're doing. Um, it's giving your, you power. It's giving your power back. When I had my moon, a key, uh, rights yesterday with my friend, Cindy, it was just her and me. I had to go in and, and see myself pulling up the energy, which was relatively easy for me to do because I've spent 16 years on the yoga mat working on my bundas. So it became easy for me to tap into. And so I would highly suggest for anybody that has never heard of the bandhas and in Ashtanga yoga, we focus more on the bandhas than we do on the chakras, because if you don't have bandha support, you're not going to have chakra support. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
And you can see the inhale and the exhale, how it works. So the, the fact that she's able to hold herself up like that, that's coming from strong bunda from her pulling up into, does that make sense? So I want to point out, really wanted to, and that's, okay, that's Udiana Bunda Kriya, what he's doing. I have a picture on my Instagram of me doing this, Udiana Bunda Kriya. Um, that's a Kriya. So it's not, that's not the extreme, extreme motion you hold in your yoga practice, but that's just a Kriya to do like a five minute practice to do, to pull the belly up and into the, into the rib cage. This also, um, this also comes in, not just for spiritual stuff, but when we talk about flexibility of body, we're, what, we, what, what we really want is flexibility of organs. If your organs are not flexible, you're screwed. And these Kriyas help get those, those organs to start to come to life again and to become flexible again. And that energy, because the organs also represent different fundamental energies as well. Like what uh, uh, kidneys are fear, um, liver is anger. And so if we can actually get the organs to start to move throughout the body and start to detox as well from the emotions, then we're also working on our spirituality as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so I'm going to talk as much. I have a chainsaw right in my <laughs> ear over here. Some guy is cutting down something over here. So if I'm on mute, that's why. That's okay. That's okay. Like out of all the days, you can do this out of all the times you can do this. It's now while we're recording. Thanks. I Thanks. Think with the neighbor's building next door. But, um, but I, I wanted to also talk about too, just to top of touch on the bundes too. That's how powerful your Shakti is, even though the body is just an illusion. It's just an experience. It's still an experience you created for your soul. It's still the expression of the soul. And so when we work with these, these uh, energetic principles, like the bundas, like the chakras, you're that that's that's correcting the illusion that's helping you to start to deconstruct the illusion does that make sense that's why we use the body and in yoga a lot of spiritual disciplines will use the illusion we'll use it because you can feel it because pain is real to then unwind it does that make sense i hope that makes sense mm -hmm. um and that's we were talking, Stephanie, like, I won't go to a healer. I won't go at this point. I won't even go to a tarot card reader who isn't doing their own work. Mm. How can you and help when others when I, help yourself? And that's the thing. Like when I do my class with search, which start, bleh, wow, I got tongue tied there for a second, which starts on the 29th. I'm actually quite excited about it. We, we are going to talk about this stuff. Um, I'm not just going to teach cards. No, that'd be super irresponsible of me to go ahead and teach just cards. If people are going to take the cards and actually make a business out of it, they need to know how to do this type of work so that they can channel without going delusional. Um, that's very, very important. So I will be talking a lot about this book and I'm also doing this on my channel. I'm reading this. This is like the best book I have picked up in a long time and it takes me, I don't just, breeze through books. I have to be really, really like sucked into a book. This book has got my attention because this is like taking your power back on steroids because it really helps you truly see in a very easy way. When you, when you hear it, it's one thing, but when you're reading it and you got the visual and you're also bringing in the information, I just feel that we often times can absorb it even better when we are actually reading it. And it's really a bit, I'm, I'm only on the root chakra and it's such an eye opener as to even my own self, why I've reacted to things certain ways, why I've been moody at certain periods of time in my life, why I've had certain behaviors. And instead of feeling like shame mm -hmm. about a past thing that I might have done a decision I did I it's more or less now I understand why like I have a major understanding now and now I can go and start to correct these things and start to heal myself instead of relying on Dr. So-and-so down the street or instead of relying on another outside source instead of relying on a church you know I am now taking my power back and I'm he can stop now. <laughs> it's like in my ear with the chainsaw, <laughs> but it's like, it's so liberating when you can take everything into your own hands and heal yourself. 
It really is. And yeah, sometimes you do need that external teacher to hold you accountable. Yeah, let's you absolutely 100% you need a teacher 100 you cannot yeah. do this by yourself. It's going to go into chaos. And what's going to happen too is the blind spots. So when you start to have those delusions, you're going to then fall into the delusions instead of having a teacher going, Hey, no, back on track, back on track, or like, or like you try to talk yourself out of things like, Oh, my big toe really hurts. I can't do that. And the teacher's going to be like, get on your fucking mat. I mean, I tell my students all the time, I practice with a broken sacrum. For a long time, I had a broken sacrum and I still got on my mat. I modified a lot. Still got I've on my had mat. a stress fracture on my ankle. I'm pretty sure it's a stress fracture. I know what they feel like. This feels like one. And I've still been practicing um, five days a week. You now I get on my mat. I, I, I modify that particular ankle when I do the bar class. I don't modify when I do the, the yoga because it's pretty impossible to kind of do that. But nothing I'm doing is really making it worse. Um, but I still do it. And then I might pull my back out sometimes, but I know my body is trying to heal itself and everything. And I well, continue to I'll, just do I'll, it. I'll, I'll level you up one. Are you pulling your back out or is your, are your muscles strengthening in your back? And it feels well, like that's what I, I don't think it's, a, yeah, I don't think yeah, it's actually, but I get that a so, lot with students because we have these muscles in our spine that go into atrophy when we get older. And when you start to practice, those muscles start to come alive again. And just yeah. like when your quads are sore or your biceps are sore, those muscles are going to get sore and people freak out when it's the back. We've been trained to freak out. And I'm like, no, it's just your muscles waking up. Give it time. It'll stop being sore. Don't, you know, but it's, it's the mind trying to make an excuse not to do the work. Even if you do pull your back out, I've got multiple herniated discs, but I don't feel any pain in my back because my core is strong. I'm not going to yeah. go to the doctor and well, deal with it's that. Funny you mentioned herniated discs because I have herniated discs upper. So I have cervical herniated discs and I have lumbar herniated discs. So upper and lower spine. And I've noticed since I've done, especially the yoga, not so much the bar, but especially since I've been starting up yoga, they don't affect me anymore. Um, and I don't think about them. And just overall, I, I've been exercising now, I would say for roughly 10 months now. Um, and what a difference that has made just in my spine alone. Um, all of the different pains I used to have. Now, I had that diagnosis, that all around diagnosis, fibromyalgia. And I was definitely bed bound sometimes. I couldn't move very well. I would wobble and, and hobble like I like I couldn't bend my knees at times. I thought I was going to need a cane or a walker at some point. And now I'm so much more mobile than I was then. And I it took blood, sweat and tears to get to that point. Yes, it, it was not the easiest thing in the world. And plus two. I do have a streak of being lazy at times because I'm very kappa in my disposition. So earth. So I have to really light a fire under my ass to get motivated to do certain things. And so exercising, once I get the fire lit, it's lit and I actually am motivated to do the exercise. But in the beginning, getting back into that routine of exercise was not easy. And I would make all excuses in the book not to want to exercise, but I pushed myself and I pushed myself and I started to see the results. And I'm not talking about physical results. I'm talking about emotional results. You, the physical comes later, but the emotional and spiritual results of it were so amazing and liberating. And yeah, I, I still have days where I'm crying on a mat. Yesterday I was laughing on the mat. That's the first, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's all like different processes. And then you're going to have times where you might feel weaker than you did last week. And you kind of go into this dip, but you come out of it and it's just your body, you know, going through the cycles. And I only have about 10 minutes left before I have to sign out. And I know we didn't get to psychedelics, which we can talk about that the next, the next video. But what, so what we say a lot of times too, if you think about a slingshot and I see this with students, I see it with myself right before you have a breakthrough in your body and in your mind, usually your body, you'll, you'll pull back a little bit. So the body will feel heavy. The body will feel tired. It's that slingshot that pulls back. And then pff, all of a sudden you pop forward and no 
16 years in and I still cry on my mat. It's, there's not, there's not a finish line to this. There's never going to be a finish line. As long as you're in human, that's another trap. You got to watch out when people say, oh, once you do this, it's over, you're activated, you're ascended. Even in fourth density positive, we're going to have a whole set of new karmas to work through. How do you think you get to fifth density or sixth density? You got to work through those karmas too. It's a never ending, but just by starting to work on it, you've already started the ball rolling. You've already started it. And it, it does, again, there is no next life. There'll be more stuff. So there is no, knowing that there's no finish line should be a liberation that it's, you just taking it as it comes one day at a time once and, and, and understand that it's going to be painful. It's going to be uncomfortable. There are going to be tears and there's going to be depression. That's part of it. And yes, you're right. No, that's one of the most annoying things when people say to me, like, like, I don't take anybody's excuses as a teacher. I take no one's excuses as to why. No, they she doesn't. I don't. No, she unless doesn't. You're on your period, unless you're on your period or you have a fever. Those are the two times or you're giving birth. Those are the three times that you're allowed not to practice. Other than that, on your what do we tell people who can't find a teacher? I have, there is no one in my area. No well, one. We're going to be doing our yoga course. Now I would say, go back. I've said this to Stephanie. Okay. So I don't, my courses here in Atlanta that I've done for years always sell out. Like we have waiting lists. I teach one of the most thorough courses and we're going to be doing it online or we're going to reset the date after Mercury retrograde because no one wants to put anything in stone during Mercury retrograde. Um, if you go back and watch my videos, I give a lot of information out in my videos, a lot that people pay a lot of money to get from me here in Atlanta. Um, I would also highly suggest that people start reading the Yoga Sutras, start reading Eastern Body, Western Mind, start reading the Bhagavad Gita, start reading all of these books we recommend. Uh, follow Ram Das's page on YouTube, even though Ram Das is no longer living. They've archived all of his lectures. Um, and just start research. There's many. So when I first got deeply into Ashtanga Yoga, I was living here in Atlanta, Georgia, but my teacher, David Garig, who's here in Atlanta this week, and that's why I have to leave soon. He's based out of Philadelphia. So I traveled back and forth to Philadelphia. I would go to Philadelphia for the, it's only like a 45 minute flight from Atlanta. I would practice with him for a weekend. He would work with me that weekend, give me homework. Then I'd come home and practice. I would film my practices, send them to him. I was constantly texting with him. So just because you don't have a teacher that lives in your area, that's, that's normal in Ashtanga Yoga because most Ashtanga teachers live in cities. So like if you live outside of, in somewhere that doesn't have a, a legitimate teacher, you can still find one. And you have to have that conversation with that teacher. You can't just say, oh, this person's my teacher. There has to be a conversation because a true teacher needs to know they're your teacher, right? I had to have a conversation with David years ago, be like, and I ask him, will you be my teacher? So therefore he could have the right to yell at me and have the right to hold me accountable. And I still say to this day with David here this weekend, I mean, he's are his, his, he's teaching at AOA this weekend as a guest, he's packed out right now. Everything I learned, I learned from him. It was just reiterated in India because he's such a fantastic teacher. And so that's what you need to do is start from the ground up, find somebody, research people, take their workshops. If you resonate, first of all, in my opinion, don't waste your money on people that went through a training system or program. Don't waste your money, right? Find somebody that legitimately, and you can tell the difference, that legitimately has an education, legitimately. Studied with Patavi Joyce or BKS Iyengar. They literally went to India. Literally, and, and I, I don't want to hear the whole privilege thing. Trust me, India takes a lot and not all of us are a lot of us saved our money to go and gave up our I, I, that's one thing that drives me crazy i sacrifice a lot to be able to go and spend time in india I, that's why i don't have children right i sacrifice a lot to be able to do that so find those people who did that who dedicated that time follow them if you jive with them and then have a conversation with them and say will you be my teacher they need to know that and then be, ex be expected if they're your teacher, they're not going to be your friend. They're not going to be, they're not going to be like chummy with you. They're going to hold your foot to the fire. And even though we're friends, Bryce, you taught me a lot. You still hold me. You're hard on me. You're no, very hard on me. I'm and actually you, not as hard as some Ashtanga teachers. There are some Ashtanga teachers that are way harder than me. Even with certain things, I'll say something hurts. And then you're like, okay, so let's figure this out. Where is that coming from? Like, 
and you help me brainstorm and figure out and get it. But you don't tell me you guide me and you don't, you don't even, I can't even use excuses. I was actually on the phone um, with somebody the other day when we were talking about it. And I said, yeah, she doesn't put up what excuses. And I said, I do get ang I used to get angry. I used to get angry, but that was me breaking through my own shit. Yeah. Right. That wasn't, I wasn't necessarily mad at you. You were guiding me to get through and break my own programming and everything like that. And, and I, I was coming to these realizations. Like you said, you went through a dark night of the soul when you started to realize none of this is real. That was happening for me, especially with the religious stuff. And so anyways, um, they, if a real teacher is going to hold you accountable, a real teacher is not going to hold your hand and coddle you and, and, you know, allow you to make all sorts of excuses. So, um, and they're very, very highly educated and trained. So if, if I, if, if every single person quit exercising because something hurt or was uncomfortable, the whole world would be overweight. Yeah. Which might be why the whole world has an imbalance when it comes to that. You're not a pretty little princess or prince sitting up on your little mattress, can't get touched by anything. That's not why you came to earth. You came to earth to feel the pain. You came to earth to have these ex experiences. And if I can get on my mat, it's hard for me to get up in the morning. 16 years later, it's still hard for me to get up and practice, but I do it. I don't, and that's what drives me crazy. I'm like, I've literally practiced through a broken sacrum. I've seen people with bloody noses on their mat keep practicing. I've had bruises all over my body from this practice and I still do it. We have a student at AYA. I think I've talked about him before, Booker. He's, to me, the most advanced student we have at AYA. In AYA, we have a lot of students practicing advanced series, a third series. Booker has several palsy. And I know he doesn't mind me talking about this because we talk about Booker all the time. He has several palsy. So that means one of his arms, half of his body doesn't really work the same as the other half. He was sent to AYA to the Mysore program because the Vinyasa Flow Studios all kicked him out. Because first of all, we can talk about this next time too. You should not be going to a teacher who not only choreographs the class but does a lead class. That's not traditional. It should be Mysore style, where you're working with the teacher teacher individually one on one, which we'll talk about more next time. Um, but Booker came in so he could have that one on one individual attention. That man will never finish primary series. But he comes into that mice room every single day with a smile on his face and works his fucking ass off. He never complains. He sweats. Whenever he's challenged with something, he digs right into it. He can't even lift both of his arms up. He has to take one arm and pull the other one up with it to do a composition. When he does a jump back for Syria Namaskar, he has to come to his fist because one of his arms isn't like the other one. There's modifications that have to be made for him because of the cerebral palsy. If that man can get his ass on the mat every single day and work through it with the obstacles he has, you can sure as hell get on your mat in the morning. And, and it's great because the students at AYA, they walk in. And you can tell they're, they're thinking of excuses as to why they want to skip a certain posture or not do their full practice. They walk in and they look at Booker and they get on their mat. Yeah. That's so it's amazing what people like that, they're just, they're inspirational because they have even more challenges to face. I, I noticed walking into a grocery store, those with like cerebral palsy or you know, any kind of disability, they're the hard workers. And then you got regular people just complaining. What do you have to complain about? Yeah. Look at them. They have so many challenges, but they're doing it. I mean, I have arth bad, or had a bad arthritis. It hasn't been, I haven't had a flare up in a few years now, but it's nothing compared. My body is relatively healthy compared to what, and, and that's why I say Booker's the most advanced student at AYA. It's not because he has the most advanced practice. It's because he's actually practicing yoga. He's doing it for the right reasons. And he I could barely like, hold myself up with the yoga at first or with anything doing the bar because my wrist hurt so damn bad. They felt broken and I kept pushing through and I kept pushing through and it hurt like freaking hell. And I just wanted to cry. It hurt so bad. And now I can hold myself up. 
And that's so common. Wrist pain. Like when you told me, I was like, oh yeah, that's so common. That's like, I would say probably eight out of 10 people experience that. And what that is, is you're not protracting, you're not pushing. And so when you're, when you have that wrist pain, any type of pain, that's your body telling you where to pay attention. It's not your body telling you to stop. It's your body telling you, Hey, your body's the GPS of your soul. So it's saying, Hey, something you need to pay attention to this. Well, what is this connected to? The hands are the extension of that fourth chakra. It's interesting. You said that because I had a little bit of an emotional week. And yesterday when I got on my mat, I noticed for the first time my wrists were starting to hurt again, but I just said, okay. And I, and I related it to the heart mm -hmm. because now, now with my knowledge, I, I understand that it's an extension of the heart chakra. So I'm like, okay, so what hurt this, that, what do I need to work on with this? It's interesting when you start to figure out what is linked to what and, and like start to figure out you know, where everything is connected, because then that's where you can really hone in and try to work out. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, I think you do that. I've got to sign off soon because I have to go to the Shala with David. But um, we have so much more to keep going, guys, with the next with the next uh, episode. But I really do like 10 hours of this because there's so much to talk about. I, I mean, we didn't get to half of it. It actually does make me mad when people give me lame excuses. Like it really does make me mad because I'm like, that's so disrespectful. To, to come in and say, oh, I can't do this because my wrist hurts. Well, 20 of the other people in this room are also on the same problem. Your wrist hurts because you're not protracting. Okay, let's work on it. It, it makes me mad because, because so many people in the world, you're disrespecting all the other people in the world who have the integrity to work through it. And so we have to start thinking about that integrity. And I will leave you before we um, have, to, I have to sign off because I have to go. I will leave you something I told Stephanie uh, the other day that Patabi Joyce used to say. Any man can practice yoga. A fat man, a skinny man, an old man, a young man, a healthy man, a sick man. The only man who cannot practice yoga is a lazy man. Mm -hmm. and, so, people, and in traditional yoga, I'll tell you this, in traditional shalas, students do get kicked out for being lazy. It happens all the time. You dismiss a student because they're wasting your time. And so you have to take this serious. And we are in a world, the cabal has set us up into a world where we have to have safe places and you can't, but that's not traditional. That's not, you need to have your, heat, your feet held to the fire by someone who's also had their feet held to the fire, right? You need to have someone that's going to help you see past your blind spots and it's going to let you experience the dark night of the soul and kind of babysit you through it, but not coddle you. Like, cause by coddling you, you're not going anywhere. They're going to let you have that breakdown and monitor you while you're having it, but then also say, okay, it's like one time before I let you guys go, when I was up in Philadelphia with David, I was in this busy mice room and there was a girl practicing beside me. Um, I can't remember her name, but she was, and she, I could tell, I could just feel that she was having a really tough practice. Like every posture, I could just feel her energy, like something was going on. And at one point she just sat on her mat and put her hand, head between her hands and just started crying. And David just kept working the room. That's what we do when that happens. Someone just, um, we just let people have their moment. And then after you could tell she was trying to compose herself, David just came sat and sat beside her by the mat and was like, you okay now? And she said, yep. And he goes, all right, get back to it. He just sat beside her and said, you, you, you got your composure now? All right, get back to it. He just let her have her moment, let it come out. And then she got right back up and started practicing again. And so, you know, Anyway, I think we should do like a 10 part series <laughs> on this work. Um, but yes, guys, again, most important thing, find a teacher, whether your, your modality is going to be Reiki or yoga or Tai Chi, look at the resume of the teacher. It's okay to quest. It's okay to interview a teacher. It's okay to go in to the studio or the shawl and be like, what's your experience? Where, who's your teacher? That's the most important question you ask a teacher. You ask, you ask me, Bryce, who's your teacher? My teacher is Sharat Joyce of KPJY in Mysore, India. My American teacher is David Grieg, who is one of the 50 people to be certified by Patabi Joyce of KPJY of Mysore, India. Those are my teachers. They have Wikipedia pages. You can look them up. All right. So that's the most important thing you do is you find someone who has someone they're accountable to. You see what they've studied. Ask them what they've studied. 
when you go to the yoga teacher, ask them, do, do you speak in Sanskrit in your class? If they say no, don't go to that teacher. Do they ask them if they play music in their class? If they play music in their class, don't go to that teacher. There's these little things that you can look for to help you find the right path. But in that being that said, sometimes we make mistakes with teachers and that's also important to the path we're on too. I've had some shitty teachers before I had David and that was important because I learned what I don't want. And it helped me learn the difference between the good and the bad. Okay. Yes. So anyway, guys, I have to run because I have to go um, with David. So anyway, guys, uh, thank you, ladies. We'll do this again. Uh, leave us your questions. Let's see if we have any questions in the audience. And next time, let's get to, let's text and figure out a time in the week to film again. Let's get to psychedelics and stuff too. Okay. Yeah. All right. Love you, yeah. ladies. Bye. Bye. Bye everyone.